His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Hallelujah. God is so good. Think about it. God is so good. Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, and he's so good. 
for your cleansing thank you for your healing lord thank you for your deliverance for hallelujah we are more than conquerors through him for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world hallelujah we are overcomers hallelujah we are never victims we are victors in jesus christ hallelujah oh we praise him tonight amen for his matchless love we praise him because he's keeping us hallelujah the writer said, God is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. Be glory and majesty, dominion and might. Hallelujah. In his presence, his fullness of joy. Let us worship him tonight. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's fullness of joy at his right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Oh, what fellowship divine. I know you've been there before, yes. In His presence, there's fullness of joy. At His right hand, there are pleasures for again for the king of glory tonight i feel something tonight all of my son that see in his presence as fullness of joy at his right hand there are pleasures for time for the king of glory tonight he's worthy of all praise oh bless him tonight come on now in his presence hallelujah 
Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We give you praise tonight. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Hallelujah. We're grateful to be in your presence, Father, to feel your touch, to feel your hand upon us. Have your will in our lives today, God. We love you. We give you praise. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Clap your hands unto him. Jesus. He is worthy to be praised. Thank Amen. You, Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. And uh, first off, I, I want to ask Sister Natalia to come up. She, amen, has a special need tonight. And we're just going to have you all reach your hands towards her. Amen. Brother Tibbs, if you'll anoint her, we're going to pray over her. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. She needs God to open a door for her. Amen. Hallelujah. And God is able in Jesus' name. Father, we pray tonight for Sister Natalia. Let the hand of the Lord be upon her. Let your blessing be upon her. You said the steps of the righteous are ordered of you. I pray tonight, God, that you would order her steps aright, that you would open the doors you want open, that you would close the doors that you want closed. Let your glory be upon her. Let your blessing be upon her. Let your will be done in her and through her. Father, you know her need tonight, and you're able. Hallelujah to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we think or ask. I ask you to meet the need for her tonight, God. Do the miraculous. Do the impossible. You are the almighty God and there's nothing that you can't do. Bless my sister tonight and strengthen her. Let faith arise and let the enemy be scattered. We give you praise and we give you thanks tonight, God. We believe you for the supernatural. We believe you for a miracle tonight. In Jesus' In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we just thank you in advance, God, for hearing and answering our prayer tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you for your blessing and thank you for making a way, Lord. You are a great God and you are greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. We also want to pray for Sister Kay tonight. Continue to remember her. We need to pray for Sister Mia Francis. She uh, had heart attack symptoms and went to Holy Cross. Amen. And I believe came home today. Amen. Thank God she's okay. Amen. So just ask God to give her a quick recovery. Want to continue to pray for my wife tonight. She is home from the hospital and Hallelujah. doing well. Amen. Hallelujah. Pray for me. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Pray that you'll listen in Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. And God will help us. Amen. But he will. Amen. Hallelujah. I think, I'm not sure. There's probably others that are sick amongst us. If you know somebody, just call their name out tonight. How many of you got something you want God to do? You, Amen. Let's Thank ask you, God to meet every yes. need that's in the house tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you tonight. You are the God that heals all of our diseases. And there's nothing that you can't do, Lord. I pray, touch Sister Overton tonight. Touch, I pray, Sister Kay's body tonight. Touch Sister Mia, I pray, oh God. Let the healing virtue go forth. Touch Sister Donna Walters tonight tonight. Let your hand be upon them. Let your anointing be upon them. Rebuke all sickness, I pray, God. 
give them a quick recovery. You said by your stripes we are healed and we claim that virtue tonight and we claim your power. Lord, you know every need that's in this house tonight, whether it's spiritual or financial or, or a direction or whatever it is that there is a need. I pray tonight, God, meet all the needs. Take power, take dominion and authority, I pray. Hallelujah. Let faith arise and let the enemy be scattered. We give you the praise tonight, Lord. We give you the thanks tonight, for you are a miracle working God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Clap your hands and make a joyful noise unto him tonight. In Jesus' name.
lift your hands and give him praise tonight. Hallelujah. Sweep over us, Lord. Let that peace that passes all understanding, let it embrace us and engulf us, I pray, God. Hallelujah. Let your hand and anointing be upon us. Let your will be accomplished through us, Lord. I thank you for peace tonight. I thank you for your peace tonight, God. In the middle of the storm, hallelujah, you bring peace and joy and comfort into our lives. I praise your mighty name. I praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your peace tonight, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In the middle of the storm, the peacemaker is there. Hallelujah. Thank God for his peace tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The storms get raging. The thunder starts sounding, rumbling. But the peace of God is still in our hearts. Amen. Thank God for peace. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We're going to receive our offering in just a moment. And as you're preparing to give... Uh, like to just give you a praise report amen, amen. little azariah rouse received the holy ghost Woo! to god be the glory Hallelujah. amen the three sweeney girls were refilled this week amen hallelujah and that's the the last report i got who knows what has happened since then amen praise god i'm excited about that in jesus name amen praise god and I did hear Sister Holly also, amen, prayed back through, amen, or, or got renewed, amen. Praise God, amen. So to God be the glory, amen. Thank you for helping us and investing in our kids, amen. Praise God. Only God knows, hallelujah, praise God. And who knows, maybe some kid goes up there, gets the Holy Ghost, ends up the next missionary or something, hallelujah. If Jesus doesn't come, so give God the praise. Amen. A couple of announcements. want to remind you that uh, this Sunday, Michael wanted to let all the parents know, amen, that they're going to do some lawn games for the youth, amen, and uh, play some games outside and probably have some eats and stuff. So if you have a young person, amen, bring them out Sunday night and... Uh, be a part of that, 6 o'clock, amen, praise God. Also, we will, we're going to have a 4th of July barbecue, if you're, that's on the Saturday, the 4th of July from about 12 to 4, and if you don't have anything else going on and you'd like to come, just come. The church is going to supply hamburgers and hot dogs, and if each of us would bring a dish to pass, then there'll be plenty of food for everybody, amen. So, looking forward to that, Amen. Also want to remind you that Purpose Institute is going to start on August the 28th, amen, and if you would like to sign up for classes, you can do so on their website. You go to purposeinstitute.com and register for the classes, and uh, Sister Overton's teaching a class, Michael's teaching one, I'm teaching one, and Brother Vogler's teaching one this semester, Amen. and then we're going to switch teachers next semester, so I just encourage you, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, amen, amen. hallelujah, you will never go wrong studying the word of God, amen, so I encourage you to sign up for Purpose Institute. Also, on the 19th of uh, July, we will have Christian Life College with us on Sunday morning. Amen. And they'll be singing and preaching on that service. And so, uh, we're going to take it easier on you in the month of July than we did in May and June. So, I wore you all out, and it's evident by who's here tonight. Thank you for coming to church. Amen. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory. Brother Darrow, if you'll come, we'll pray. You can march and come and give. Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you for your blessings and goodness in our life. Thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. Thank you for filling our kids with the Holy Ghost, Lord. Thank you for your blessings upon them and all those that are at camp this week. Just let the glory of the Lord be upon them. I pray bless those that are here tonight. And I pray bless the ministry of your word. We just give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. Will you? You march and come and give to the Lord. Amen. lift your hands and give him thanks again hallelujah Hallelujah. thank you for your blessings in my life thank you for your goodness lord we just give you thanks thank you for the holy ghost tonight god thank you for the house of god thank you for the people of god let your glory be upon us i pray in jesus name clap your hands under the lord tonight he is worthy to be praised amen brother vogler's coming to minister the word tonight Would you welcome Brother Vogler as he comes? Amen. Praise God. Is God good? Is God good? Is God good? Amen. Amen. Praise God. I won't keep you standing long. Let me read a scripture, we'll pray, and uh, we'll see what God has for us tonight. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. Matthew 18, verse 1. At the same time, Jesus, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest? is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. That's my title tonight. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for another opportunity to gather in your presence, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are going to bring forth the word that will minister to our hearts tonight, Lord. I pray that you would allow me to step aside, my flesh to step aside, Lord, and that your spirit would minister tonight, Lord. I pray that you would touch each heart, Lord, and help us, Lord, to understand what you would have us to understand tonight. And we give you all the praise and all the glory, for you are worthy. Amen. You may be seated. I would be remiss before I really get into this by not thanking our pastor for allowing me to come up here. You don't know what an honor it is to stand behind his pulpit where he normally stands and bring forth a thought 
uh, to you tonight. So I really appreciate the opportunity and his trust in me. So thank you. God is good. Amen. Amen. We've all read this account about Jesus and the disciples, and we've all heard preaching about uh, the way the, the, the disciples kind of bickered and fussed among themselves over who was the greatest. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit. I noticed something that I thought was kind of interesting in the, in the events that happened, and I'm, and I'm going to go through these in what I think is chronological order. Of course, you know, when you take the Gospels and you try and put them in order, sometimes it's difficult to, to you know, absolutely say this happened before that happened, but I'm, I, I, we're going to try and go through this in chronological order. So in Mark chapter 9 and verse 31, it says, for, the, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed. He shall raise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? Now you would think, that the next thing that they would say was, well, we were talking about your coming death. Well, Jesus had been telling them for about, uh, for the last year of his ministry, Jesus had begun to tell them about his death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, it started when, when uh, Matthew, or excuse me, when Peter made that declaration to Jesus, and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus had asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some say you're Elias and some say you're this prophet and some say you're John the Baptist. But Jesus then said, who do you say that I am? And he said that Peter jumped up, old bold Peter, ready to, to, to make a bold statement regardless of whether it was right or wrong. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus patted him on the back and he said, congratulations, you did not give that to, you know, you didn't come up with that on your own, but God gave that to you. And because of your being obedient to the Spirit of God, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And it was shortly after that, just a verse after that, where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, And from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. I believe this began the last year of Jesus' ministry. It was at that declaration that Jesus told his disciples, you're right, I am the Christ. I am the son of the living God. And this is my mission. This was the first time he told them that he was off to be crucified. He had asked them to pick up their cross and follow him. He'd asked them to do that. And I can just imagine the, the thoughts that must have gone through their minds when they said, pick up my cross. I'm going to pick up that ugly thing of torture. I'm going to pick up that thing that, that it signifies death and, and brutality. And, and it's against everything that I know and everything that I feel. I'm supposed to pick that up. And Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. So Jesus is telling them for the very first time, I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to pick up my cross. And this is what's going to happen to me. And from this time forth, the Bible says, he began to teach them about his coming death, burial, and resurrection. But immediately after that, in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 22, Peter says he took him and began to rebuke him. Imagine this, Jesus, or, or Peter, who just declared that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, begins to rebuke him. Begins to say, wait a minute, Jesus, you're not right. Oh. Be it far from thee, Lord, that this should not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind thee, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savoreth not the things that are be of God, but those that be of men. Five verses ago, he was on top of the mountain. He had made a declaration of who Jesus was. 
Now he's been slapped down by the very one that he declared the glory to and told, you are Satan in front of me. Get away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with you right now. Now I have a question off the subject. How many of you would have followed Jesus after that rebuke? It's hard to say. A lot of people left Jesus when, they rebuked, when he rebuked them. But Peter hung in there. Peter took the rebuke. Peter took the criticism. He hung in there. He may not have been happy about it, but he hung in there. That's off the subject. So, so Jesus tells them and begins to teach them about his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, do you think Peter talked to the other disciples about what Jesus said to him? Man, can you believe what Jesus just did to me? I tried to help him out. And look at what he said. Can you believe that? Who does he think he is? Well, Peter, you just said he was Christ, the son of the living God. Well, yeah. So, so Jesus continues, and we go back to the scripture that I started with in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 31. It says, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered unto the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he, he is killed, they shall raise the third day. This is the second time he's telling them about his crucifixion. But they understood not that, uh, they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Why do you think they were afraid to ask him? Peter got slapped down when he talked to him about it. What do you think the other disciples? The other disciples weren't nearly as bold as Peter most of the time. So they were going to say, no, we'll leave that one alone for right now. We don't understand, but we're going to leave it alone for right now. And then he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that thou disputed among themselves by the way? Now, you would think they would say, well, we were curious about this whole crucifixion thing, this whole torture thing. What, 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 what is that really all about? Can you explain that to us? But what do they say? But they held their peace, for by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. They weren't even concerned, it appears, about Jesus' crucifixion. They, they didn't understand it, so they set it aside, and they begin to argue among themselves, who's going to be the greatest? A little pride came up in their hearts. A little, little, uh, 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 little self-gratification began to show itself. A little, a little uh, uh, I want to be the best. I, I want the best place at the, at, the, uh, at the wedding. I want the best place in the kingdom. You know, Jesus told a parable about, about not taking the best place, but sitting down in a lower place and letting the governor of the, of, the, of the feast come and bring you up to the best place and let them exalt you and not exalt yourself. But they were not even, appear, it appears that they were not even concerned about what Jesus had to say about his death, burial, and resurrection. Maybe it was they just didn't understand it. Maybe it was they just couldn't grasp it. Maybe it was just they just they couldn't believe it because this was the man that was going to set them free from the Roman tyranny. He was going to set up a kingdom on this earth. How could that possibly be and him go and be crucified? They couldn't put the two things together. They just couldn't figure it out. They could not figure it out. So again, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and I think this is just a couple of weeks before his actual crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 20 and verses 17, it says, And Jesus, coming up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them. Now, he took them apart. He's got special instruction for them. He's got special teaching for them. And he says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. This is the third time that Jesus has taught about his death. 
and they shall deliver him to the Greeks to mock and to scourge and to be crucified and to crucify him and the third day he shall rise again. So Jesus is teaching on this subject again. The very next thing that happens. Then came to him the mother of the Zebedee's children with his with her sons worshiping him and declaring a certain thing of him, desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that that these my two sons may sit, the one at thy right hand and the other at thy left hand, in thy kingdom. Jesus is telling him about his crucifixion. And we got lobbying for position. Who's going to be the greatest? And they brought mom in. They went to their mother and they said, Mom, could you help us out with Jesus? We need your influence on the man of God. We need you to come and, you know, get us some sympathy. He was talking about his crucifixion and they were lobbying for position in the kingdom of heaven. And verse number 24 says, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the other two brethren. They were upset. Wait a minute. You can't lobby without us. We've got to have a chance. You can't go to him without having the other ten of us go with you. We've got to have our opportunity to plead our case for what we want in the kingdom of heaven. They were upset that the brothers used this ploy. They weren't upset about Jesus' crucifixion. They wanted to know who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You beginning to see a pattern? And this was not the worst. This was not the worst. They were in the upper room. It's just within hours of his crucifixion. They're in the upper room. Jesus has just wrapped a towel around his waist and taken a basin and washed the disciples' feet. Now I want you to know he washed Judas's feet as well. He didn't say anything to Judas about it being a betrayer at that point, but he washed his feet. He was a servant to the man that would subsequently, just hours later, betray him with no malice in his heart. Jesus had no malice in his heart while he was washing that man's feet. And he says, this is my example to you of what? A servant. I want you to be a servant. And then he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, the cup is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you. Do you get the picture? Do you see where they're at? This is a poignant moment. Jesus is just Wash their feet. He's now giving them the, what we call the sacrament of the Last Supper, which we are to use to remember his death, burial, and resurrection. And then he says, And behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Look, one of you is going to betray me so that I have to go and be crucified. And what was the disciples' response? And well, first let me read. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it as it was determined. But woe unto him by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. They began to ask themselves, "Are you going to betray him? Are you going to betray him? Are you going to betray him?" And there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? Every single time Jesus talked about his crucifixion, they began to argue among themselves 
who is going to be the greatest. What a blind spot. They didn't get it. They did not understand. Now, Jesus had taught the, uh, the, uh, the disciples. He had taught the Pharisees. He had taught the Sadducees about being a servant, about being uh, a greatest. Who would be greatest in the kingdom would have to be least. Jesus taught that over and over and over again. Outside of the realm of just the disciples, that was part of his public ministry. Who would be the greatest? If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant. These guys did not get it. His closest disciples could not understand because every time he talked about his crucifixion, they started arguing about who would be the greatest. Well, I want to answer the question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus. Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And no one comes a close second. No one comes a close second. So that settles that question. But I want to talk about the blind spot. I want to talk about the blind spot. Jesus had, in fact, given the disciples a reason to argue about who would be the greatest. Because in Matthew chapter 19, this is after they went to Capernaum and after they'd had their first argument about who would be the greatest. But after that, in, verse 9, in, in, eight, in uh, Matthew 18, 28, he said, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they knew they had position. They knew that they had something to look forward to. They understood that they were going to be more than just the average Joe in the kingdom. But that wasn't good enough. They wanted to be number one. They wanted to be number one in the kingdom. And they thought the kingdom was here on this earth. They thought the kingdom was going to be during their lifetime. They truly thought that, they were, that Jesus was going to set up that kingdom on the earth. How do we know this? Because even after his resurrection, just before his ascension, they asked him, are you going to set up the kingdom now? Is now when you're going to set up the kingdom? They still thought it was coming on this earth. They didn't understand it was coming much later, 2,000 years later as it seems, because that's where we are today. So they didn't understand that, but they, but they thought they were going to have these positions, and they began to argue over where they were going to stand in the hierarchy of the kingdom of God. They had a blind spot. And each time Jesus talk to them about his crucifixion. And each time that they began to argue about their place and their position in the kingdom, Jesus began to teach them about what it means to be in the kingdom of God. After in, in Mark, after the first example of when they began to argue, in Mark chapter 9, verse 34, he says, but they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. That is in a capsule. That is in a nutshell what it means to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, be a servant. Not a slave. A slave has no choice. But a servant chooses to serve. There was a commandment in the Old Testament. And a servant or a slave could say, I love my master. 
And it was time for him, it was time for that slave to be released, whether it be because of time or money or whatever. And that servant, that slave could say, I love my master and I want to continue to serve my master until I die. I love my master and he is a good master to me. And they could make that decision and they would take a, 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 an, a, an instrument called an awl and they would put that servant's ear on a, a piece of wood and they would drive that awl through their ear, through their earlobe. And that would be the mark that that man has given himself, or if you will, has given his all to be the servant, not the slave, but the servant of that master. And that, all, that is all Jesus wants of us. He wants our all. He wants us to say, I'm willing to take a mark upon my flesh, which tells everybody that I am the servant of this master, not a slave, but of my own free will, of my own justification, of my own desire, of my own love. I choose to serve this master. I choose not to go free. Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, become least, become a servant. In 35, he says, and he sat down and called the 12 and said unto them, if any man desire to be first, he, and uh, shall, the same shall be last and the servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, whosoever shall receive of one excuse me, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but he that sent me. So Jesus took that child, and we hear about that all the time, Jesus' example of being a child and coming to God as a child. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 1, it's the same uh, set of scripts, same, same incident. Um, it says, in the same, at the same time, the disciples said unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as a little child, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we understand that in our Western mindset as a child being a, a helpless, innocent person that can't do much for themselves, and they are innocent and they are trusting, and they go to the Father and they, they, they give themselves, if you will, to the Father, trusting the Father to provide for them. That's how I've always heard it taught. That's how I've always heard it. You know, that's, that's a Western mindset. We love our children, we honor our children. We don't terrorize our children. We don't, we don't uh, 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 you know, do evil things to our children. We honor our children. We, we discipline them and we raise them like they should be raised, but, but, you know, we honor our children. But we're not talking about a Western mindset. This is an Eastern mindset. When he set the child before him, the word child in the, in the Greek, the, I can't pronounce these words, it's P-A-I-D-I-O-N, and it means a youth, a little boy, or a little girl. But the word that that word comes from means, one of its meanings is a servant or a slave. A servant or a slave. In the Eastern mindset, from what I understand, the children were not as honored as they are in the Western mindset. They were used as workers routinely. They were not given the first meal. 
They ate after dad and often after mom. And they were used, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about the, the, the lowliest servant who washes the feet of the person who comes to the house. Often it was the child who did that lowliest of all tasks. So the, the child that Jesus brought into himself, he could have very easily have said, instead of saying, become as a little child and be, uh, and except ye come as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. He could have very easily said, except ye become as a servant, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Remember, just before Jesus brought the child to himself in Mark, he said, if any man desire to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then he brought the child and set him on his lap. So he couldn't have been talking about, you know, coming to God as trusting when he used that example. He had to have something about servanthood in mind when he brought that child to him. So what he really was talking about, I believe, was you've got to come as an obedient child, an obedient servant, and do what is asked of you and do what is required of you to make it into the kingdom of God. If you want to be the greatest, you must become as this servant child. So that's what he taught after the incident in Mark. And then after the incident in, uh, in Matthew chapter 20, when he was on his way to Jerusalem, and again in the upper room, he used the same examples in those two cases. He said, but Je this is Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. He says, but Jesus called unto them and said, you know that the princes of the, Galatia, of the uh, Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Let's look at the world, Jesus said. Let's look at the way of man. The way of man is they have this hierarchy, and the guy that's on the top is in charge, and everybody down the line listens to the guy above him. And they, they enforce that hierarchy. And if you don't live up to the hierarchy, you're going to be punished. He says, don't let that happen among you. That's the way of the world. We don't want to do things the way of the world. We want to do things God's way. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to minister unto, but to be, uh, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Don't look at the world. Watch me. Watch what I do. Have you ever told your kids, and, and I'll raise my hand, I'll say I've done this, don't do what I do, do what I say. It's a pity that we have to say that, but we're not perfect. And sometimes we have to say that. Don't do what I do, do what I say. I may not always do right, but I most of the time know right. Most of the time. Jesus never had to tell his kids, don't do what I do, do what I say. Because he always did right. He always did right. He says, I hear what the Father says, and I say it. I see what the Father does, and I do it. He was the perfect example of Romans 8, where it says, follow after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Jesus truly followed after the Spirit every moment of every day of his life. He was so in tune with the Spirit, he would never have to say, do what I say and not what I do. But Jesus said, don't look at the example of the world. Don't see the example of the world. Look at me. Follow my example. 
What have I done my whole ministry? Served. I have healed others. I have fed the thousands. I have walked on water to minister to you. Everything that I've done is to minister to someone. Jesus said, follow my example. Be like me, not like the world. So he gave them this example after twice. He gave them that example twice after they started to complain and gripe about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And they still didn't get it. Even after his crucifixion, they still didn't get it. It was only when they received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost that they had to begin to get a glimmer of what it meant to be a servant. It talks about in the book of Acts how that the prophets or how that the apostles said, you know, we shouldn't be waiting on tables anymore and choose out seven men to, to wait on the, uh, on the widows. Well, you know what that means to me? That means they had been doing it. They had been waiting on tables. The apostles, the 12 apostles, the ones that would sit on the 12 thrones and judge Israel had been waiting on tables. They finally got it. They finally got it about being a servant. But they said, there's plenty of opportunity to serve. Let some other people begin to serve now. We're going to spend our time in prayer and fasting. Now, I'm just going to interject this because I feel like interjecting it here. The man of God should not have to, should not have to you know, scrub the bathroom. He will, and he has, and he does. He should not have to. He should be at home or in his office praying and fasting and studying the Word of God, getting a vision for the church. There are opportunities to serve in this place that nobody is taking up. Nobody is, is grasping onto them. All you have to do is ask. Believe me, there are jobs for you to do. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, serve someone. Who do you serve? Who are you to serve? I want to serve God. Praise God. I want to serve God. Woo! We all want to serve God. Amen? Do you want to serve God? Oh, really? Do you want to serve God? All right, let's try it again. Do you want to serve God? Well, I got a few of you. I, I, this is group participation. I don't demand a lot when I get up here. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big, you know, you talk back to me. So I, but this time I, I want to hear something from you. Do you want to serve God? Yes. All right. All right. Let me ask you a question. What job would someone ask you to do that you would say no to and lose your place in the kingdom of God? Let me repeat that. What job would you be asked to do and you would say, no, I won't do that? Understanding that by saying no, you're going to lose your place in the kingdom of God. Is there anything that you would say no to? Now let me ask you another question. Have you ever said no when someone has asked you to do something? I'll raise my hand. I have said no. But we just said we would not say no to anything if it loses us our place in the kingdom of heaven. How do you know what thing it is that you're being asked to do that loses you your place? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I'll, I've, I've answered a question like this. Brother, will you do this? Let me pray about it. I've said that. 
I've said it. Let me pray about it. Well, is it in your ability to do? Yes, it's in my ability to do. Do you have time to do it? Yes, I have time to do it. Well, what do you have to pray about? Why do you have to pray about it? If you, if you know how to do it, you have the ability to do it. And even if you don't have the ability to do it, if you have the time to do it, you can learn how to do it. Why do you have to pray about it? We are to be servants. Servants do what they're told. And you don't ask a servant to do something. You don't. A servant is told what to do. And a servant doesn't talk back. How much of a servant do you want to be? How great in the kingdom of God do you want to be? How much of a servant are you willing to be? How much of your all are you willing to give? How much are you willing to sacrifice? Jesus gave it all. He died. I don't think our pastor is going to ask you to die. I'm pretty, pretty confident of that. I don't think anybody in the leadership of this church is going to ask you to die. Jesus may ask you to die, but I don't think our pastor is going to do that. How much do you want to get into the kingdom of God? How much do you want to, to what position do you want in the kingdom of God? What are you willing to do to serve? Now, I'm not saying you have to work to get into heaven. That's not what I'm saying. Don't go home and say that. I taught, a, I taught a lesson about six months ago that absolutely refuted that. But listen to me. We are made to work for God. We are created to work for God. Not to work for our salvation, but to work for God, that's why we are created. That's why he saved us. He has got a work for you to do. Are you doing it? And that work is not a job. It is service. It is service. Paul talked about service in Philippians chapter 2. He says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He says, he says now let's, let's focus in on one thing. Let's focus in on one thing. Let's, let's really laser focus on one thing. We want to be in one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Don't let your pride get in the way. Be humble. Don't go around boasting about what you've done. Don't go around telling everybody about what, what, what you're doing in the church. But in lowliness of mind, humility... Let each esteem others better than themselves. Don't compare ourselves with ourselves. We heard that scripture before. But look at another person and esteem them better than you. Say, I thank God that you are higher than I am. I thank God that you know more than I do. I thank God that you work harder than I do. Esteem others higher than yourselves. Don't always continue to push yourself forward. Don't always continue to push yourself up because when you do that, you're, spe you're stepping on somebody else. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, I used to read this scripture and I used to think, wow, this says I should en envy other, other people's stuff. But that's not what it means. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to envy other people's stuff. It's supposed, it means we're supposed to look at them and consider them higher than we consider ourselves. Look every man not on his own things. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Be concerned about the things of others 
just like you're concerned about your own things. Treat others' things just as if they were yours, like you bought and paid for them. Don't misuse or abuse someone else's stuff because it's theirs and not yours. Now we get to the crux of the matter. Let this mind be in you. Remember it said we're to be in one accord of one mind. Here we go. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God. If anybody had a right, if anybody had a right, Jesus had a right. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was God walking around in the flesh. He was God incarnate. He, if anybody had a right, Jesus was deity. If anybody had a right to say, not now, not this time, it was Jesus. If anybody had a right to say, I don't want to go to the cross, and I'm not going to go to the cross. You know, the Bible says he could have done that. He prayed in the garden, and he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Had he not said that in Hebrews, it tells us that God would have honored his prayer and not forced him to go to the cross. If anybody had the right to say, no, not this time, it was Jesus. It is Jesus. And yet, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He took upon himself the form of a servant. Before he could be king, he had to serve. Before he could be king, he had to serve. Before you can be great in the kingdom of God, you have to serve. We need to follow the example of the one and true and mighty God. But made of himself no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. I've always found it interesting that in the Old Testament, God is always seeking praise. God is always seeking for his people to praise him. You ever notice that? And, and his people, when they're, when they're in when they're in full communion with God, they are praising him. They are going to his temple. They are offering the sacrifices in faith and praise and worship to him. Jesus never sought praise for himself. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus never sought out praise for himself. Now, God glorified him. God acknowledged him as son. And others acknowledged him as son, but Jesus never insisted upon it. Why is it that the God of the Old Testament wants praise and Jesus in the New Testament doesn't seek out praise? Well, the Bible says that God is not going to share his glory with any. Amen? And it says that no flesh, no flesh will glory, will, will surpass the glory of God. Jesus was deity, but he was also flesh. He was a man. And because he was a man, he could not take on the praise that only is reserved for the Spirit of God. So Jesus did not 
insist upon praise for himself, but he humbled himself. He bowed himself. He allowed himself to be that man that was beaten and spit upon and, and uh, whipped and nailed to a cross. He allowed himself to go through that pain, ag agony, and anguish for you and for me, the ultimate in servanthood. He allowed himself to die so that we might live. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How great do you want to be in the kingdom of God? How great do you want to be in the kingdom of God? How far down are you willing to go to serve? What are you willing to do to be a servant so that you can be great in the kingdom of God? Jesus had to serve before he could become a king. We have to serve before we can be great in the kingdom of God. How do you serve? How do you serve? What is there for you to do that is called service? We, we have a Sunday morning Sunday school class here with the adults at 845. This is an advertisement for those of you who are interested. 845, Sunday morning Sunday school class. Every Sunday morning, same time, same place, we're right here. Come out and join us. All right, enough of that. <laughs> but we have, a, we have this Sunday school class, and now I've forgotten my point. But how, how much are you willing to lay down? My, my point was this. I, I, I taught a, a series of lessons on prayer, and my my, in one of the lessons, the point was made that we cannot have a prayer life. You cannot have a prayer life. You have to have a life of prayer. Jesus did not have a prayer life. He had a life of prayer. We cannot have a servant life. Life, Because if you, have a, if you have a prayer life, that means you also have a work life and you have a social life and you have a family life and you have all these other lives that you deal with and you compartmentalize. And, and the prayer life is just one of those things that you put in the box and you shove away when, it's, when you're done with it at, at, you know, at whatever time you pray. And, and then you go about your day. That's what a prayer life is. But a life of prayer... All those other lives that you have, your social life and your work life and, your, and all the other lives, you know, your recreation life and all, that is all incorporated into the life that is called prayer. So I don't want to have a prayer life anymore. I want to live a life of prayer. I don't want to be a servant anymore. I want to live the life of a servant. I want to give my all. I'm going to fall and I'm going to fail. But I have a desire to serve God. I have a desire to serve God. And I don't always do a good job, but I have a desire to serve God. And I'm going to pray about service. And I'm going to try and be a better servant. And I'm going to try and be a better servant to you. Who do I serve as a servant of God? I serve God first and foremost. But I serve you as my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I serve those that I work with that know not God. And I serve those that I'm driving on the freeway with that are cutting me off. I am their servant just as much is I am your servant or God's servant. God has called me to a life of servanthood and he's going to bring people into my life that he wants me 
to serve. The question is, am I going to humble myself and be that servant, or am I going to rush by and get my own agenda completed and do my own thing and make sure that all the boxes are checked on my list today? Who wants to be a servant? Really? No, no, no. No, no. I don't mean I don't mean just raise your hand. I mean who wants to serve? Who wants to live a life as a servant? It's not going to be easy. There are struggles, there are difficulties, there are temptations. Pride will eat at you, will try and rear its ugly head and try and get you to acknowledge what you've done to others when the Spirit says, shut up, shut up, shut up. I know we're not supposed to use that word with kids around. Forgive me. But, but God doesn't want you to be boastful. Let Him give you the glory. Let Him acknowledge you. Let Him bring you to the place and the position that he wants to give you because you've been a servant. I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant. I'm done. I never, I never know how to start. I never know how to end. So forgive me. Let's stand and we'll pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help me Help each of us, Lord, to grasp a hold of this message, Lord Jesus. Lord, don't let us, Lord, be contentious for who's going to be in the greatest in your kingdom. Don't let us argue, Lord Jesus, over what I've done or what you've done or how you've served or how I've served or any of that stuff, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be humble and to be live a life as a servant, Lord Jesus. Lord, so that we can honor you in all things. So we, Lord Jesus, can lift up your name and give you glory because we know there is only one that is greatest in the kingdom of God, and that is Jesus. Lord, let this word be buried deep in our hearts, Lord, and let it produce much fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed.